Hello, everyone. My name is Guy Royce, and uh, this is my talk, Mystery Machine Learning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight at uh, um, well, what was formerly two meetups in uh, in Phoenix, but uh, thanks to uh, to virtualization and uh, and viruses, uh, is one virtual meetup. Uh, so I, I'm kind of just calling it the Phoenix.net meetup. I think that's probably a fair thing to call it. Um, uh, I got to talk tonight, Mystery Machine Learning. It's a Scooby Doo themed talk on uh, machine learning, uh, specifically on recurrent neural networks. And so uh, I already introduced myself. Uh, I work for Redis Labs. Uh, I'm a developer advocate there, uh, which means that coming at events like this and talking is, is a significant part of my job. Um, uh, we at Redis Labs would like to remind you that Redis Labs is uh, paying me to do this. And uh, so please check out our stuff. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, um, you've probably heard of Redis. Uh, Redis Labs is the company that uh, funds a lot of the open source development uh, for uh, Redis. And uh, we have an enterprise product as well that's a, sort of the grown up professional version of it if you need to do uh, more than the, uh, the uh, OSS Redis can, can do for you. So that's where I'm from and why I'm here. I'm gonna show a little bit tonight on a product uh, we have that extends Redis called Redis AI. Um, that's what we're gonna do. So, but uh, there's one really important caveat. Uh, this is a data science talk. And uh, this caveat is something I always put in front of my data science talks. And some of you might know what this stands for already, but it, it stands for a thing. And uh, can anyone guess who doesn't know already? I'll wait an awkward amount of time. <laughs> I know Barry knows the answer to this question. What's the answer to this question, Barry? Unmuting. Uh, I am not a data scientist. That's correct. I am not a data scientist. Uh, I am a developer. I've been writing software for a couple of decades. Um, actually, I might be getting closer to 30 than 20 now. Um, I, I've done a lot of things, but I'm not a data scientist. I don't have the math background. I don't have the statistics background. I am, however, a fan of data science. And so uh, what I like to do is I go out, I go out and I learn about something that interests me. Uh, that's data science -y, and uh, then I put together a talk and share what I've learned. So uh, that means uh, I'm bringing a developer perspective to this uh, and uh, sort of a, uh, not a super mathy perspective to it. So I'm trying to intuit how these things work. And so it, uh, the net result is, is that they tend to be fairly accessible if you don't have a heavy math background or if you aren't a data scientist. Um, but it also means there's holes in my knowledge. So as we go into this talk, you know, I may, um, say something that's slightly incorrect. You might have a question that I don't know how to answer. It's because I'm not a data scientist. Um, I'm still learning, uh, well, hopefully like you are. So in addition to not being a data scientist, but being a fan of data science, I'm also an enormous fan of Scooby-Doo. Uh, I first watched Scooby-Doo. Well, gosh, I can't tell you the first time I watched Scooby-Doo because I was too little and I don't remember it. It's because Scooby-Doo is older than me. And so, but uh, Scooby-Doo was great. It had this uh, sort of idea that, uh, there was always a rational explanation for things, right? Originally, they sort of changed that as Scooby-Doo's evolved. But the original idea was, is that it's a ghost, it's a ghost. No, it's just a man in a mask. And, um, and in some ways, machine learning is kind of like Scooby-Doo in that it's, um, it's a mysterious thing that everyone feels like is it's like it's just doing magical stuff, but actually it's completely deterministic and, and understandable. Uh, the details are complicated, uh, but it's, it's, there's nothing magical about it. It's just math at scale. And so uh, we're gonna try and solve that mystery today. Uh, we've got a specific problem we're gonna solve. Uh, that problem is that we want to figure out, uh, given a line of text, uh, which member of Mystery Incorporated said it. Was it Daphne, Fred, Scooby, Shaggy, or Velma? That's our mystery we're gonna solve. And in doing that, we're gonna go deep into uh, uh, how some of the underlying technologies for recurrent neural networks work. Um, we've got some work to do for sure. Uh, I'm going to build an app. Uh, using a CSV file full of uh, Scooby-Doo lines from the Scooby-Doo movies and cartoons. Uh, the first column is the name of the character who said it, whether that's uh, you know Scooby-Doo or Shaggy Rogers um, or Velma Dinkley, I think is her last name. Um, and, and then the, the second column is the line from the movie. And that's the entire data set. We're going to use this data set and we're going to build a, uh, a uh, recurrent neural network, a neural network that can then... Uh, be run on Redis using Redis AI. And then we're gonna build an application that uses that model in Redis AI to make predictions and tell us whether it's Daphne, Fred, Scooby, 
Shaggy, or Velma this set it. So that's what we're going to build tonight, and we're going to learn all the things we need to, to do to know how to do that. Uh, topics we're going to cover are uh, neural networks. So we're going to talk about how neural networks work in general, um, and we're going to dive deep into how neurons work and the individual pieces and, and kind of show how they scale up. Then we're going to go into how recurrent neural networks work specifically and how they're a variation of a general neural network. Uh, and then we're going to use Keras to build this neural network. And so we're going to talk about Keras and how you can use Keras to build neural networks. And then we'll talk a little bit about Redis AI and how we can host our, uh, our built models on Redis AI and then access them from any language that you want. So that's the outline for tonight. Sound good? Cool. So let's talk about neural networks first. So this is a neural network. You've probably seen this picture before, right? Uh, you've got an input layer where uh, you, know, you, you bring four different numbers into this, uh, this particular neural network. Those numbers are processed somehow by these neurons through a couple of hidden layers. And so it goes from the, the input layer through the hidden layers, and then ultimately to an output layer where you get new numbers. And so uh, this is kind of what neural networks do at, at the super, super high level. We're putting, in this case, four numbers in, we get three numbers out that would tell us something about what we're trying to predict. The hidden layers do a bunch of math inside. Um, but what this really is doing at the end of the day is it's drawing a line because that's what most machine learning is. It's drawing lines. And so, uh, you know, we, we put in a number and we get a, a, a line out. And so uh, we get a line like uh, this uh, hyperbolic tangent here, which it was just a convenient graphic. And uh, we can use that line to either classify things. For example, if something's on one side of the line, uh, if our numbers output from the model are one side of the line, then it's a hot dog. And if it's on the other side of the line, it's not a hot dog. And so uh, this, this is what's called a binary classifier. And you can actually draw multiple lines and then say, well, it's not Scooby. And this line here says it's not Daphne. And then this line here says it's not Velma. And this line here says it's not Shaggy, then it must be Fred. So you can draw multiple lines to classify more things than that. And so drawing that line, then figuring out where our, our number falls on either side of it will tell us uh, what, what class it's in. You can also use these lines uh, to predict another number. So here uh, we have a simple graph that shows uh, the uh, spookiness level as our X. So our input would be the spookiness level. Uh, so uh, maybe we got a spookiness level of five or a spookiness level of zero. And, um, and what it predicts is the number of Scooby snacks required uh, to overcome the fear of that spookiness level. So if you've got a spookiness level of two, how many Scooby snacks would it take? And so you take X and you, uh, you find the point where it intersects the line and you find out that uh, you would do it for two Snoopy, Scooby snacks. So this would be a very useful tool for uh, uh, those not Shaggy or Scooby in Mystery Inc. So, um, so these are sort of the two ways you can use these lines. Let's look at uh, the components of our neural networks. So we kind of know how to process the output uh, because it, it's, it, it, it's a function basically that draws a line. Uh, but neurons that make it are also functions that draw lines. The simplest neuron would have an input, a single input. Most neurons have more um, typically, but you, you can make one that has a single input, an X. And it has an output, a Y. And so as soon as we put in an X and get out a Y, we now have something we can plot in two dimensions, right? You can draw a line. It might be a curvy line. It might be a straight line, but you can draw a line with that. Uh, inside of our neuron, we have a weight, which is multiplied by the input, and we have a bias, uh, which is added to that multiplication. And so these are the parts of a neuron. And uh, so the formula for what happens in a neuron when we put a value in and get our Y out is uh, this formula right here. Uh, it's the input times the weight plus the bias yielding an output. And uh, if you're astute and remember algebra one, you might realize that this is a familiar formula. Anyone recognize it? It's y equals mx plus b. And that's slope. And yeah, where the weight is basically the slope and the b is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the y-intercept. It's, it's like all you had to do was flip the W upside down, and all of a sudden it's the formula. Right? <laughs> it's got a Levenstein distance of one. Um, so this is the formula for drawing a straight line. And so uh, this neuron draws a straight line. Now, uh, the, 
you know, the bias is going to move it to the left or the right. So it changes where it intercepts uh, the Y axis and the slope is going to, you know, tilt that line back and forth like that. But each neuron can draw a particular line. And so they might look like some of these lines. But uh, sometimes a straight line isn't what you want, um, particularly if you have deep layers together and you have a bunch of straight lines and then they feed into a bunch of straight lines. Those are just going to draw more straight lines. But if you could do something to make the line not straight, then you could get the final output to have more of a curve to it. And so you could draw more interesting lines than just straight lines as outputs to your neural network. And uh, the way you do this is you use an activation function. So the activation function takes the, uh, the, the, the MX plus B and then transforms it before it spits out a Y. And there's a few varieties of these and there's one that is just what everyone always uses. Um, one is that you can use a sigmoid. Uh, you can uh, transfer, translate uh, that, uh, that calculation of what would be Y into a value from zero uh, to one. It actually approaches zero and it approaches one. And this can work okay. Uh, what can happen with neural networks is sometimes you'll keep upping the value, the output that, so that the weight will get higher and higher and higher and higher. Uh, and then you just can't push the, the output any higher. And so because this approaches one, but never reaches it, you need larger and larger numbers to, to get it to activate just a little tiny bit more. So sigmoids don't work that great. Uh, another variation on this is you can use a hyperbolic tangent. It's got a similar problem, but also introduces negative numbers, which tend to get a little wonky. Uh, because as you're lowering uh, numbers uh, to try and get to that value on, all of a sudden it goes negative and the behavior reverses. And so uh, negative numbers really aren't all that great either. And what everyone sort of found through trial and error to work best is uh, rectified linear units. Uh, rectified linear units are pretty easy. It's max of X comma zero. So if uh, the value coming into this is, or Y comma zero, the value coming to this is positive zero or higher, it's that number. Otherwise it's zero. And so that's all it does. And so it allows, it gets rid of the negative numbers, but allows a linear uh, progression on the positive numbers so that the, the different neurons in the network can fire harder or fire more softly, which doesn't really happen in the tangents, hyperbolic tangents and the sigmoids. And so rectified linear units tends to be the go-to. Uh, it seems to work the best. And so um, what that means is, uh, uh, actually, not what that means. That, that's one of the activation functions we tend to use. But uh, another detail. So we, we've done that really simple case where we got X yielding a Y, but our neurons actually often have multiple inputs, sometimes hundreds of or thousands of them. And so um, what's that formula look like here? So you know, scale that up a little bit. We got three X's coming in and a Y coming out. And so we've got three weights for each of those X's. We have a single bias and the activation function in the Y. So our formula ends up looking like this x sub zero times w sub zero plus x1, w1, x2, w2, plus the bias is going to yield y. Uh, and this is basically y equals mx plus b cast in multiple dimensions, in four dimensions in this case. Uh, and uh, you can represent this uh, in a slightly more mathy way. And this is the mathiest this is going to get using a sigma. And all that sigma means is sum up this little bit of the equation right here. You know, do this multiplication for all the values of i and add them together and then add the bias. So it's just saying, you know, hey, we've got three x's, then we need to, you know, multiply, uh, multiply them with against their weights three times and add them together. So, you know, and so this is how we scale up that neuron. And uh, what really happen is happening here, this is four dimensional. So this formula is defining uh, instead of a line that is bisecting a two-dimensional space that we can do classification with, or we can do a prediction of a number with, it's instead uh, taking a four-dimensional space and taking a hyperplane, a three-dimensional hyperplane and bisecting it, right? So, you know, you got two-dimensional space with a line, uh, you got a three-dimensional space with a plane, you got a four-dimensional space with a three-dimensional hyperplane. And then, so if you had like 50 dimensions, then this is drawing a 49-dimensional hyperplane to bisect a 50 dimensional hyperspace, which obviously none of us can visualize, but you can see the pattern where it's sort of, it's N minus one for dimensions to split it in half. And then with that, then there's an intercept and you can still find that number you wanna predict, or you can find uh, 
you know, what side of the plane that's on. So all of these neurons do this, and then the neural network is a whole bunch of functions that is makes a function itself. So you, you've sort of got functions inside of functions inside of functions. The neural network or the neuron has an activation function at the end. The neuron itself is a function. And then the neural network in total is the function of all of those functions, which are part of those functions. And so here we've got something that takes our four X's as input and gives us three Y's as output. And this has got seven dimensions. And so it's doing similar things. It's drawing more interesting lines that we can use to do more interesting problems, like figuring out who said what. Any questions so far? That was sort of a little fast and kind of dense, but. And if you've got questions that are in chat, I'm probably not gonna see them because I'm screen sharing. Oh yeah, there's four questions there. There we go. I don't see any questions in chat yet. Oh, no, okay. Yeah, so please feel free to interrupt me and just ask questions. Uh, it's, it's hard for me to see the, uh, the chat questions on Zoom always hides those from us, which is kind of annoying. But so, so next we're going to talk about recurrent neural networks. And recurrent neural networks are just a special configuration of the neural networks we just looked at. So in, in this case, we've got three inputs, right? We got an input layer here, uh, x0 through uh, one and two. I think in math, everyone does x1, uh, but I'm a programmer, so everything's zero based, right? Uh, but we got an input layer. We've got an output layer, and then we have hidden layers. But, uh, and these hidden layers are lots of variation, lots of copies of these hidden layers, all right? So this the little hidden layer right here is kind of that, it's made of multiple neurons. And actually these input layers are multiple neurons and so are these output layers, but uh, I've drawn them as circles on the chart because that's convention for recurrent neural networks. But the thing that's interesting about the recurrent neural network is that it has, um, a sense of order or a sense of time to it, a sense of chronology. It doesn't have to be time, but it does, it does have a sense of order. And so uh, this first uh, node here, right? This, this, this X zero comes in and goes through a hidden layer. And then that hidden layer is used as input to the next hidden layer in addition to the next value. So if I have say like a series of stock prices, uh, I could then say this stock price was followed by this stock price 15 minutes later by this stock price 15 minutes later, and then historical data, historical predictions about the previous stock price get fed in to, to make decisions about the next stock price. So we're looking at the past. Now, again, this doesn't have to be time. This just needs to be chronological. And so we put in a whole sequence of data and then it can daisy chain that along. And then eventually you get an output layer here where uh, we start getting the outputs from those, those um, hidden layers. And so like in this one here, we see the output layer is coming in from here. Uh, and we got another input coming from here. And then its output goes to both to us as a final result and to the next layer. So uh, these are really good for anything that's chronological. Uh, you can configure them a couple different ways. Uh, this is a many to many. Uh, many to many's are um, used for chat bots. So this input layer would be words and this output layer would be words. Uh, so, um, or translation, uh, machine translation. If you think about it, a something that translates from one language to another and something that's a chat bot is kind of doing the same thing. You give it some words, it gives you some words back. So uh, many to many uh, networks can do that. This is obviously a very small one, but here we can uh, create a Scoob bot. So Shaggy's gonna interact with Scoob bot. He's gonna say, look out Scoob. And Scoob says, okay, Raggy. And then he, uh, and then he gives his uh, characteristic laugh. <laughs> and yeah, that's what he does. It wasn't as good as I usually do. My throat's a little dry. Excuse me. Still pretty um, good though. It's it needs to be deep in the throat. You don't actually. You just, just it's all throat and vocal cords. There's no anything else. Yeah, I'm not moving my mouth at all when I do it. It's really weird. But yeah, so uh, this is a many to many. So translation, chatbots, um, translation. I like machine translation. Chatbots. I don't like chatbots so much. <laughs> They're kind of annoying. Uh, you can also use it um, a one to many. That's another um, uh, configuration where you can give it one piece of data and then it will spit out um, multiple pieces of data. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this is often used for image captioning. So like uh, we could take an image, uh, caption an image here. We got a picture of Daphne 
and then caption that image, maybe giving it something that Daphne would say. So uh, here we've got uh, Jeepers, they mean business. Uh, typically, if you're giving an image data, there's, there's usually a convolutional neural network that happens in front of that. Uh, if you're curious about those, uh, you can look on the internet for a talk I did called Deep Learning Like a Viking, where I go deep into how convolutional neural networks work. Uh, so, yeah, which is a lot of fun as well. Um, so one to many is another structure and you can do many to one. Uh, many to one uh, can be used for sentiment analysis. So you can give it a bunch of words and then it'll spit out a number saying uh, how negative or positive it is. Uh, you could use it for uh, predictive text. Hey, I just entered these four words or these 10 words or these hundred words. What's a good candidate for my next word? And uh, you could use it for the purpose we're gonna use it for tonight, which is text classification. So you could give it say, hey, let's split up. Who says, hey, let's split up? Well, Fred says, hey, let's split up. So you can give it a uh, some text and figure out who said it. You could also use this for, hey, I got an email. Should I send this to uh, you know customer success or should I send this to billing or should I send this to uh, you know human resources or whatever? So you could use it to, like triage emails, uh, any kind of text data that you would want to turn into, uh, uh, you know, figure out where it goes. So those are those are the three structures: one to many, many to many, and many to one. Here we've got a nice big example for classifying text. Uh, we've got. Uh, we can handle up to seven words here. So we got seven nodes here on the bottom. And so uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take lines from Scooby-Doo, like I can't see without my glasses. And we're gonna predict who said that. So there's, a, there's Velma. She's the one that totally said that. Now you might notice if you're paying attention, um, there's some problems with this uh, diagram. One is I said at the beginning, neural networks and machine learning only deal with numbers. Pretty sure words aren't numbers. So these words need to be turned into numbers somehow. Uh, the other thing is, is that um, there's a value missing here, right? And you might notice they're all right aligned, they're right justified. I'll explain all those when I get to those. I'm just putting questions in your brain so that you uh, pay attention when I answer them. <laughs> and the other problem is, is that uh, Velma is definitely not a number either, uh, yet she's the output of this model. So uh, how do we address all those issues? We'll start with the words. So uh, how can we turn words into numbers? Well, uh, we, we do a process called tokenization. So to tokenize a word, we'll take a body of a corpus of text. Here I've got a little small mini one with some lines from uh, the five members of Mystery Inc. And uh, what you do is you take every single word here and you count them and say, you know, okay, you know, the word uh, uh, Jeepers is in here once, uh, the word uh, Raggy is in here three times, uh, where glasses is in here twice. And so you, you count them all up and then you order them by frequency. So you end up with a table like this. So uh, we've got the word like and raggy are three times and they're ordered. So we get this big list of ordered words. And then the most common word is word number one. And the second most common word is word number two, all the way to the least most common word being word number 24. And so we basically just assign a number to all the words. Uh, but we do it by counting them. And so we give the higher uh, count words. Uh, they, they, they come first in the list. And uh, that's just an efficiency play. And so uh, we then encode our sentence uh, like a, with a substitution cipher. It's like, a, it's like the Caesar substitution cipher where A is one and B is two and C is three, except um, we just do it with words instead. So uh, here, I can't see with my, out my glasses forms this you know, little uh, uh, vector of numbers here. So 10 is I, so if we look up I on here, we'll see it's number 10. And if we look up glasses here, we'll see it's number three. And so boom, words are now numbers. That wasn't so hard. And so uh, what about the missing word? Well, one of the things you might've noticed in here is that uh, like has an index of one. And I, I, and I made slight reference to the fact that I'm a developer and I always index things with zero. And uh, it's odd that this wouldn't start with zero. And so what you do is null is zero. So if you have any missing words, they get, the, they get zero. And so they end up, uh, this sentence ends up looking like this, zero for null and then 10 for I and then three for glasses and everything in between. And you, you have to do that because you have to give it numbers for all the inputs. So something's got to go in there. And so in this case, we just put zeros to the left. We pad it, it's zero padded. 
now that we've got a sentence that is made up of numbers instead of words, we need to one hot encode it. And so one hot encoding takes our entire dictionary, in our case, all 24 words, although your dictionary for anything real is gonna be much, much, much larger than that, probably thousands of words. And we create a, uh, for each number in here, we create a vector that has the column for that corresponding word set to a one and everything else set to zero. So the one is hot. The, the column that we care about is, is one. And so column 10 gets a one here and column eight gets a one here and column four gets a one here. And then here we get a zero. So none of the columns get a number. And so uh, this allows us to turn uh, the, uh, these uh, words into categories. And this is needed to go into the embedding. And so the embedding um, is, yeah, I, I honestly don't entirely know how this works. I just know that it does when I do it in Keras with Python. Uh, but the idea here is, is that you've got this, these rows and columns that correspond to words. So each of these rows in here is a word in this giant embedding. So this embedding is got a length or is as tall as the number of words in our dictionary. And then as wide as we want it to be. And in our case, it's six. And so each of the rows correspond to a word and then the columns encode semantics. So what this means is if this number is the same or is high uh, for uh, that particular word, that is related, it's more strongly associated with the idea or the meaning behind that column. So glasses is 75. We might have the word on here, spectacles, which would be very closely related to the idea of glasses. And so it would have a high number in that column as well. Whereas like the word my, isn't really related to the idea of glasses. And so it doesn't have a very large number there. Uh, like isn't really related to the word glasses either. It's almost as if all my numbers here are just random. But, uh, <laughs> but, but the idea here is, is that there's a columns encode the semantics. And so we take that one hot encoding and say glasses one, give me that column out of my, uh, uh, my embedding. And so now the word glasses is gonna be represented by one, two, zero, 14, 75, and zero. And so we do that with all of our words. And so now this sentence, uh, null, I can't see without my glasses, becomes these numbers. And so we now each of these are receiving uh, multiple values in. Okay, so um, that's what we're really inputting to this thing. Now, obviously, lots of numbers go through it, and a number comes out. But what's that actually look like? So the output is not... Velma, the output is instead a vector of numbers as well. And so here we've got numbers. And you might notice that uh, if you're paying attention that these add up to one, or if you, if you like adding numbers together. So 0.83, I hope they add up to one. Uh, nine, four, nine, seven, eight, nine, nine. Yeah, they add up to one, good. <laughs> the first time I did this talk, I, I got the math wrong and they didn't add up to one and I felt stupid. Um, so, but these numbers add up to one and what they are is they're uh, reflecting the percentages of whom uh, this, is a, uh, this line is accredited to. So it's 83% likely it's Velma, 11% likely that Scoob apparently can't see without his glasses and then the rest of them are very small percentages. So uh, what we do is we spit out in, in a, a soft max uh, representing the probability that it's that particular uh, person that said it. And so each, each column in this vector corresponds to one of the members of Mystery Inc. And so in this case, Velma is the one who can't see without her glasses. Um, you, you might have, and, and, and I also mentioned that I write justify these things and there's a reason for that. And that's because uh, recurrent neural networks actually have a flaw and that's called the vanishing gradient problem. And um, the vanishing gradient problem is, is simply that uh, when we go all the way here to the right, the decision being made by this hidden layer is 50% my most my last bit of data and 50% the result of all the previous bits of data. So half of this decision as to what who said this is the word glasses, and the half of the other half of the decision is based on every other word they said. And so it is inordinately biased towards values to the right. And then and that keeps subdividing. So my is makes up 25% of the decision and without makes 12 and a half percent of the decision and six and a quarter and three and an eight and whatever half of that is. 
uh, and so on and so on to the left. And now in this particular model with only seven inputs, this isn't a huge problem, but if you had a thousand, it's because you were trying to classify say emails, uh, that might be a problem because the last thing that someone says is gonna be the most important. I've actually, when we build this model, I'll, I'll show you that we can, I, I can put like, I can't see without my glasses scoob and it will say that that's shaggy because it ends in scoob. But if it ends in glasses, even if it's something one of the other characters would say, it tends to say that that's Velma because it's biased towards that. To address this problem, there are some more sophisticated models uh, that add some short-term memory to them. Uh, I haven't dived super deep into LSTM or GRUs, um, but they remember things that are important somehow. There's also uh, a newer way of doing a lot of these using uh, transformers um, or transforms. I can't remember, I think it's transformers. It's the thing that uh, GPT-3 is using. Um, and so a lot of the uh, text processing is using that as well. So that's how our current neural networks work. Let's take a look at Keras. Any questions so far? Cool. Keras is a, uh, a domain specific language that makes uh, writing neural networks easier. So if you want to do this using TensorFlow, uh, there's a lot of, you just have to understand a lot of the math. With Keras, I can, I can speak in terms of neural networks. I can say, I want a layer that has this many neurons on it and I want it to have this activation function. And then it does the work for me of figuring out how to do that. So it's, uh, it's very accessible for uh, programmers who don't have a data science background like myself. It's written in Python and uh, it's uh, part of TensorFlow. Uh, a couple of years ago it was added to TensorFlow. So I guess it's not quite recently a part of TensorFlow anymore but it's part of TensorFlow now. And so uh, Keras will spit out TensorFlow models. Uh, here's some code to show you how to define a simple, fully connected network, that, like the kind we looked at at the very beginning of the talk. Um, first thing you do is you create your model and, and call it a new sequential. It's called a sequential because you've got a layer followed by a layer, followed by a layer, followed by a layer in order, in sequential order. Uh, to that model, you can start adding your layers. So here I want to add a dense layer with five neurons. So uh, that's those five purple neurons in the hidden layer. I want their activation function to be ReLU. That'd be the max uh, x comma zero. And I want the input uh, to those to be of a particular shape. So I want them to have uh, four inputs each. And so four comma, this is Python code. So it, the input shape needs to be a tuple, but Python needs to know that's a tuple. So you put a comma there if you only have a tuple with one value in. And then we add another dense layer, uh, again with five nodes, uh, again with activation ReLU, but this time it doesn't have an input shape because it's not uh, the outermost hidden layer. And then uh, we have a dense uh, three output layer here. It's our last layer. And it's got an activation of softmax, which uh, does the makes the total of those numbers equal to one. So if this neural network spit out a one, a two, and a one, then a softmax would turn those into 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0.25. So it spreads it out, adds it up to one, which makes it really good for classifications, makes it really good for you thinking of it in terms of a percentage. Uh, once we've defined the layers of our model, we tell it to compile. Uh, there's some arguments here. We've got an optimizer function, uh, which is Atom. Uh, Atom is a variation of stochastic gradient descent. Um, the optimizer is the thing that uh, figures out how to adjust the weights and balance, uh, biases in your neurons to uh, make them closer to the correct answer. And so uh, it, it's, it's, and it uses, Adam uses stochastic gradient descent. Stochastic gradient descent means you've got this, this like trough and you're trying to find the bottom point, the perfect point uh, for that neuron. And uh, you, you're starting somewhere on the edge and you're going down, trying to hit that trough. And so, it's stochastic because you're jumping random intervals and it's gradient because the intervals are slowly getting smaller as you get closer to where you need to be. And it's descent because it's going down. So stochastic gradient descent. Um, and so it uses Adam to optimize what those values are. Uh, the loss function is the thing that determines how ever wrong everything is and who to blame. And so uh, we're using categorical cross entropy because we're building a classifier. Uh, so, uh, because classifiers are do categorical stuff there. It's categorical data. And then metrics is just a pure accuracy. Uh, we just want to report out the accuracy is a, you know, straight up percentage. 
uh, for us humans and say this is 97.3% accurate. So that compiles our model. Once we have our model compiled, we can then train it using the fit method. Uh, we pass it X train and Y train. Uh, X train is the training data that is the inputs. Uh, y train is the uh, training data that are the answers. So uh, we give it, uh, you know, a bunch of things that were said by Mr. Inc. And then we give it a bunch of who said it. Batch size means go through 20 of these things, then use the loss function in the optimizer to uh, adjust the values in the neural network, go through another 20, adjust them again, go through another 20, and go through the entire set of data 10 times you know, for epochs. Once we've done that, we've got a trained model. Uh, we can call evaluate, giving it some test data uh, in the same format as the uh, training data. And then it will give us an idea of how accurate our model is. And then we can start using it to make predictions, assuming our accuracy comes back in a satisfactory level. A simple RNN is, uh, can be defined in Keras as well. Here, uh, again, we got a new model sequential. Uh, but instead of adding a dense layer initially, we add that embedding. And this embedding is that, that magic semantic embedding thing that I was showing you earlier. Uh, and uh, in Keras, you just say, I want an embedding layer, or I want an embedding. Uh, and uh, the input dimension of that is how big my vocabulary is in words. This Here we've got our 24 words from our earlier example. Uh, we got our output dimension is our how many columns we want. And we had six in our previous example. And input length is how, how many words we're going to have in our, our recurrent neural network. And so that will build an embedding layer for us. Uh, it understands the words and the semantics. There's dictionary stuff built into this already. So we don't have to worry about any of that. Um, once we have our embedding, we can then say we want a simple RNN, which is going to build that RNN layer in the middle. And then we uh, give it a number of units, make it as uh, equal to the embedding columns. And then uh, for our output, we say we want a dense layer uh, with uh, five outputs with an activation of softmax. That'd be five outputs for the five memories of members of Mystery Incorporated. So that's how we could code an RNN. It's actually not that much code. So let's, uh, let's see this actually work. I've got a demo here uh, that will uh, build an RNN. And I got my mic in a way that I can't see my, uh, my screen very well here, but I'm gonna show you the code. Pay no attention to the fact that there's a little yellow uh, annoying thing there. Uh, this is the, uh, the thing that builds my model. So here we've got, um, let's take a look at it here. I've got my training. I'll take a look at the training data here first. So this is the training data, Shaggy Rogers, just what everyone says, right? It's just all the lines. Uh, yeah, there's Velma Dinkley saying, I can't find my glasses. My glasses, I can't see without my glasses. <laughs> and a new set of eyeballs, apparently. Um, yeah, so this is, this is our data. And so I just read this in using pandas. And then uh, I do a bunch of stuff to filter it out so that I've got the uh, X is uh, all, the, uh, all the lines that the characters say. The Y is what character says them. And then I've got to encode these from text uh, to, uh, to numbers. And so for my output, I use a label encoder and I just call fit with the labels. And then that, that will say, you know, uh, Fred is zero and Daphne is whatever numbers they are, right? Zero through four. And then uh, it gives me those classes and I'll save those out for future use uh, by my uh, application uh, in JavaScript here. So here's what that, that future use will look like there. It's just a little JSON array. And that's uh, setting up, so that, that's all the label stuff. And then we actually uh, transform those labels using that encoder. And then we'll use those later in our predictions. Actually, we have to take those labels, sorry, and convert them to categorical as well. So that's one hot encoding them. And then here we're tokenizing the text. So this is uh, our vocabulary has got 10,000 words and we're gonna do a maximum of 150 words per uh, line from the movie. Uh, we build a tokenizer, ooh, and give it our uh, max vocabulary as the number of words that we want in our dictionary. And then we just give it our, uh, our big, um, um, you know, big array of text and it will create a dictionary for us. Then we'll take each of features and turn them to sequences. So this takes uh, the string that is a text and breaks it up into individual words. And then we pad those words on the left uh, with zeros. And so now our features are tokenized. 
And we got a dictionary here that we want to save off. Our word index looks like this. It's just a little JSON array. It's got the name of the word and then the number for that word. So the is the most common word in this dictionary. U is the second most common, all the way down to uh, eyeballs and sandals at the, at the, uh, the least most common words. And there we go. The little zoom thingy came over my tab and I couldn't click it. So then here uh, we're doing some, uh, we, we, we split that uh, data into an 80-20 split so that we can save 20% for testing later for evaluating and 80% to train. Uh, and then here we are using Tensor, uh, using Keras. We got 32 embedding columns. Uh, we've got our sequential model, create our embedding. We add our RNN layer. We add our dense layer. We call compile. We print out a little summary. We train the model here calling fit. We evaluate the model. And then I go ahead and make some predictions by uh, taking these phrases and parsing them into all the things that are needed here. So um, ultimately, uh, we'll say uh, we split that word, get all the words, um, uh, pad it with spaces. And then where is the, uh, yeah, we, we turn those words into a word vector by using that word index that we created earlier. So we're basically turning these into numbers and padding with zeros on the left. And then uh, eventually somewhere down here, where's that here? Ah, uh, here it is. Line 200, uh, we pass in that sequence of words and make a prediction. And then we're gonna get a number from zero to four out representing one of the members of Mystery Inc. And so we have to then um, translate that back out and print out the results. So I can actually run this here. Let me do a uh, Python build model dot pi. This will build the model and make a couple predictions. So we can see here, it's uh, splitting out things. And so I'm, I'm logging all the things. It's showing the, the label encoder. So Daphne Blake is zero, Thelma Dinkley is four. Uh, we've encoded the labels here for all the words. All right, that's, that's not, I'm sorry. We want, want uh, that's the number of uh, unique uh, labels we have. There's, here's the words where we've tokenized that. Uh, goes through, describes our model here. Here's all the trainings that it went through. See our accuracy starts really low and uh, our loss is high. Our loss goes down, our accuracy goes up until, crap. <laughs> My accuracy is at 95% and then all of a sudden it dropped to 43.79%. Uh, I have a model that is overfit. It has memorized the test data, the training data. Uh, and um, ultimately, this means it's really good at understanding their catchphrases, but if you give it something less meaningful, it'll have trouble with it. Um, for what I'm doing, this is okay, because this is just a little demo. But this is actually a good, uh, this is sort of an object lesson in why you wanna work with a data scientist when you're a developer, because they would know how to solve this problem. I, as a developer, I'm like, how would I change my data to get it to be less overfit? And I don't have the statistics background to really figure that out well, or I'll do it in naive ways. Data scientist knows how to do that. Here we got some predictions that we made. So uh, we pass in jinkies. If we uh, encode jinkies, we'll see that jinkies is number 153. And then there's a whole bunch of zeros to the left of it. And then here's our outputs. Um, and Velma Dinkley got 0 0.8089, so 80.89%. So that's probably Velma. Here's a like hang on scoob. And uh, that is 99% Shaggy Rogers. Roke Raggy comes out as 97% Scoob. And so um, what I like about this is that Roke Raggy are both words in our dictionary, <laughs> which I just think is kind of funny. Um, but yeah, so uh, we've got a model. Uh, those models have been saved out here to the model folder. I've got an Onyx model and a protobuf file for TensorFlow. So cool. I did a little bit of machine learning with Python. I have a second demo, so don't worry. We're, we're going to put this in an application. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Redis AI first. Uh, Redis AI is a uh, it's a module that extends Redis with uh, AI features. So a module is a plugin that you can use to add to Redis to give it new capabilities, add new types, and that sort of stuff. Uh, Redis AI lets you add tensors and lets you add models and then make predictions with those models and tensors. Um, there are other modules uh, that allow you to extend Redis. Uh, there's one that gives you a graph database. There's one that uh, does probabilistic data structures. 
Uh, there's one that does time series data. There's there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, and and uh, it's an open API, so people can create, you can create your own modules as well. I, I was looking online, someone actually created, I took SQLite and in, created a Redis module and embedded SQL inside of Redis, uh, which uh, was both, um, well, I wasn't sure what to think about that. <laughs> um, it was just kind of weird. But uh, so that's what Redis AI is, it's a module. Uh, it turns Redis into a model server. Uh, so uh, Redis AI can handle lots of models and everyone can talk to Redis. So it allows you to use Redis to host your models. And of course makes the uh, inferencing fast and easy. Redis AI supports uh, multiple uh, model types. Uh, it can do TensorFlow models, PyTorch models, and Onyx models. Onyx is the open neural network exchange. Uh, so most models can be converted to Onyx models, which means that most models can run on, uh, on Redis AI. Uh, yeah, there's a question from uh, some guy, but not guy. I, I see a hand up anyhow. I, I don't see the question in, in the comments. Uh, hang on. I, mean, I would gladly answer it if you unmute yourself. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to plow forth. Okay. Yeah, I don't see the question either. That's weird. Okay, well, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna carry on and then if the question comes, the question comes. So Redis Sounds AI good. adds two new data types, uh, the tensor and the model, like I kind of mentioned that earlier. Um, it's actually pretty easy how it works. Uh, you can call ai.modelset to add a model to Redis AI. Uh, you can call ai.tensorset to amazingly set a tensor to, in, into as a type in Redis AI. You call ai.model run giving it uh, you know, the tensors and the model name, and it will spit out a new tensor, which you can then read using AI tensor get. And so that's the, the whole very complicated process. Uh, here, here it is using the Redis uh, command line. Uh, tensor set takes a key for the tensor you wanna set, takes the uh, type of that tensor, is it floats, doubles, ints, whatever number is in that tensor. Uh, it takes the shape of that tensor, so this tensor is too wide by seven tall, or too tall by uh, uh, too wide by uh, too tall by seven wide. I, I guess it doesn't really matter, uh, but it's a two by seven tensor. And then you pass in the values for that two by seven here in the values keyword. And so, like the first half of those represents the two, and the second half is the other half of the two, and they each have seven words. And so, in this case, we put our a couple of lines from our, our Mr. Inc. members here. Uh, if you want to read a tensor, you can use AI tensor get. And then again, you provide the key name of the tensor you want to read. And you say, I want the values. Or you can say, I want the metadata. Or you can say, I want both. And it will spit out those values in that metadata. To actually use a model, uh, you need to uh, uh, put a model into uh, Redis AI. Uh, it's a little trickier from the command line. You actually need to use Redis CLI from the command line from your shell script as opposed to within Redis CLI with the dash X flag. And the dash X flag says, take standard in and make that the rest of my command. And then the rest of our, uh, the beginning of our command is calling model set with our key, uh, the type of model that it is, whether it's uh, intended to run on the CPU or the GPU. And then we have a binary that's on our hard drive that is the Onyx file that we're redirecting in with the, uh, the, the, the less than side. Uh, to run the model, we can just do that from uh, Redis CLI in, inside of it. And we just say model run, give it the model name, and then just the input tensor and where, what we want the output tensor to be. So these commands are uh, fairly straightforward. I mean, I always have to look them up because there's a lot of arguments, but what they do is pretty limited. Uh, you know, it's set the value, set a tensor, get a tensor, it pretty much always works the same. There's, there's not a lot of variation in them. Um, using uh, this, we can then put all, all the things that we've learned together and build a little application where we can say, Roke Raggy, that application will feed that into Redis. Redis will hand that off to Redis AI. Redis AI will invoke the model. We will get a prediction. Redis AI will return that. Redis will return that to our application. And our application will tell us that that is something that Scooby said. So let's take a look at that application. Uh, I apologize that at a .NET meetup, I'm going to show you Python and, and uh, JavaScript, but that's what I'm doing. <laughs> but I know you all have to know JavaScript whether you want to or not, right? So I've got the model is built here. I've got over here. I'm going to go ahead and start a little um, 
uh, it's just a simple little express app written in Node that uh, knows how to talk to Redis AI. If, uh, if I bring up the code here for it, it's all in one file. And um, it's, I'm not gonna go too far into the code here. The main thing is I connect the Redis. I read the blob files, uh, the onyxes, uh, the, 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 the model files as blobs into, uh, into uh, JavaScript here. And then I call model set here and here to set two different versions of it. I got an onyx model and I got a TensorFlow model. Um, and then I log out that I did it. Uh, that word index, those two, the, 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 these guys here, I'm going to hang on to those. Uh, I, I load those in. There's my word index JSON, and I parse it. And then there's my classes, so I can I can decode in my JavaScript code here. And then I just got a handle request, and all it does is uh, look at uh, you know a basic HTTP uh, uh, GET request. I think it's GET. And then um, you know one of the arguments is the backend you want to use, and then the other argument is the line you want to decode. Uh, this is a very JavaScripty line of code here, where I, I take that line of text, I convert it to lowercase, I use a regex to uh, get rid of anything that's not a, a letter or a number. I replace uh, any white space with empty space. I trim any white space on the edges, which is probably redundant. I split that then into uh, all its individual words, so uh, this white space doesn't get rid of single spaces, just anything that's more than one space. Um, and then I map those words using the word index. And then sometimes I go to zero or I get a null, so I replace those with zero. So now I've got a left aligned zero thing once I pad it. So this is that same numbers that represent that, uh, those words. And then I uh, set a tensor. I run the model for both back, whichever backend. And I get the tensor that has the results. And then I decode the results using uh, the uh, decoder, the classes. So I take the number, which is really easy because it's just an array. And I get a number from zero to four. And so I just index it. <laughs> it's decoding. Yeah. Um, and then I spit out the results. And so uh, I've got a little front end application that will. Um, um, hang on can't talk and type that will expose this um, to something that is like a web app here. So if I go to my browser, the front end application is nothing special, but it, it, it does this. So here is uh, our little Scooby-Doo application. So I can enter a line from Scooby-Doo, like, uh, what should I do? Uh, let's split up maybe. And I'm gonna use the Onyx model. And I click the jinkies and it tells us that Fred says, let's split up. If I look at uh, the output of my server here, let's make it big. I can, you can see that uh, it's spitting out the results of saying it's 88.97% 8 sure that's Fred and then all the other members of Mystery Inc. Uh, let's do a, a different one. Let's do Jeepers, they mean business. That's Daphne. Uh, anyone got any uh, any anything they want to see? Any lines they want to do? Anything funny? You actually, paste it in chat, then I can copy and paste it. <laughs> um, uh, I can't see with my, my glasses, of course. Rut row. Rut row raggy. That's Scooby Doo, of course. Like Zoink Scoob, like. Zoinks, Scoob. That's Shaggy, of course. Um, and of course, like I can't see without my glasses. Oh, let's get rid of the like. Let's go. I can't see without my glasses, and that's going to be Velma, of course. But if I do this, I can show. I can highlight the vanishing gradient problem because it ended in Scoob. And so it's it's giving more weight to the uh, yeah I'm clueless ah, let's let's do that one yeah <laughs> yep that came back as Fred <laughs> Oatsworks. 
Um, but it, it it's kind of cool because things it doesn't recognize will also get the zero. So I I can say like I can I can mix uh, universes. Say like I'm a goofy goober scoob, which is mixing SpongeBob references uh, with a scoo uh, Scooby Doo references, and it's still going to think that that's Shaggy. So it does understand things that it can figure out things from context a little bit. I, it says I don't know what a goofy goober is, but uh, I know what like and scoob means. So that's probably Shaggy. So um, and um, and it was actually very sure about that as well. It wasn't as sure about Fred. It was it only got a uh, forty eight and a half percent. So and that's exactly why Sean. Uh, it's because Shag uh, tends to end everything with the word scoob. And so that's a pattern of his, but it's also because of the vanishing gradient problem uh, is that th that last word has more importance. It's half of the prediction is that last word. And so if half of the prediction is that last word is Scoob, then Shaggy is going to be the best answer that it can get. Here are your glasses. Yeah, that's going to come back as Velma because she always, I'm, I predict it will come back as Velma and it does. Um, because she tends to enter towards the glasses. So it's the same problem. It's that same vanishing gradient problem. So how's that for a fun little demo? <laughs> exactly. It's wrong. <laughs> uh, this is why it's, over, it, you know, this is actually, this highlights the vanishing gradient problem. And I've also got an overfit model. So uh, that I'm sure that's playing into it as well. Yeah, it was, it was you, you can see it's sort of reflected here a little bit, right? It's only 50% certain that that was Velma. Like that, that that's not a very confident result. Um, and then it, it, they thought it could just as easily have been uh, Daphne that would have said that. So, cool. Well, let me get back to my slides here. I've only got a couple more. So uh, we covered a lot of material here. Uh, if you've got any questions, of course, feel free to pop them up here. Uh, we covered neural networks and how they work. Uh, we covered recurrent neural networks and how they work. And we went into uh, some sample code to give you sort of an introduction to Keras and how you can use it to build neural networks pretty easily. We talked about how you could deploy them to Redis and build applications that can ex ex execute, use these models to make predictions from whatever language you'd like. I use JavaScript because that's how I've chosen to live my life. <laughs> so um, here's some links if you want to check stuff out. Uh, redisai.io and redis.io. Um, these are links. Uh, and check us out. Uh, check out some of our Redis stuff. I've got, uh, I'm actually, I run the Redis Discord server. So if you've got Redis questions, you can always get on the Discord server there at Redis, uh, discord.gg slash Redis. Um, and uh, ask me or uh, one of the other members of the team. Um, we got free classes on Redis at Redis University. And uh, we got a bunch of YouTube videos on Redis Labs YouTube channel. I just had one upload today or yesterday. I, I'm starting a series using GraphQL with uh, Apollo GraphQL to expose uh, Redis data. So if you're into GraphQL and into JavaScript, then that's a, some stuff to check out. There's a bunch of stuff on there. Uh, this is the most important link. It's the QR code that will take you to uh, all of my slides and all the sample code that we saw here today and everything. I promise you that if you scan this code with your phone, that it is very reliable. It will never give you up. It will never let you down. It will not uh, take you to another site and deceive you. So uh, yeah, so scan the code. Uh, I'm Guy Royce. I work for Redis Labs. Uh, please give me a follow on Twitter if you get a chance. And uh, thanks. Are there any questions? I've got one. Sure. Given the diminishing gradient problem, would it make sense then to reorder the words so that the least frequent words are at the end? Um, I'm going to go with no, because the order still matters. Like, like, like uh, it's the vanishing gradient problem is a problem, but the, the order of your data is actually an important part of what it does. Uh, part of the reason it manifests so strongly in the model that I built is because my model sucks. <laughs> yeah, it's overfit, and so it's very simplistic. It's also a bunch of lines from a movie. And so a lot of people are going to say things that are just this, you can't tell who it is. And so in some ways, it's not that great of a problem even. Um, you know, someone says, let's go. Well, everyone says, let's go, right? You can't, you know, but that's a line from the movie or from, uh, from Scooby-Doo. Um, 
And so it fixates on sort of their catchphrases, which is exactly what we as humans do, which is what I think is kind of neat about it. But um, the vanishing gradient problem then exacerbates that even more because it, it already doesn't have a lot to go off of. But you, you need that ordered data for it to actually be a meaningful network. So reordering won't solve the problem. Um, uh, the, the solution is to use the other types of uh, neural, uh, the variations on recurrent neural networks, the uh, LTSMs and the, or the LSTMs. Oh, yeah, the LSTMs. I always want to say that backwards. And the uh, GRUs, um, or to use a transform. So uh, those are the- That makes sense. If I wanted to reorder my data as I was um, scoring it, I would also need to reorder my data as I was training it. And if I'm going to pre whatever, I'm kind of losing out on the beauty of machine learning. I'm yeah. you know, validating my pre-training, not my, or pre-filtering, not validating the data. Yeah, well, and you might have hundreds of thousands of records. And so uh, you'd have to come up with a process to uh, order that data accordingly. And you'd probably want to build a machine learning model to do that. And a recurrent neural network would be a good choice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That makes sense. Any other questions? I went a little long on this talk, but it's, it's also, I figured everyone would be okay if I was a couple minutes long, so. It, it's, a, it's a meetup, not, there's no, no one following me, so it's not that big of a deal, hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully no one got bored. An awesome talk, it was really cool. I'm glad you went as long as you needed. It was really, really fun. Hey, um, this may be a naive question, but like, how did you choose, like there are like five um, inputs or dense, like you had, you had like three levels of layer, right? Like what made you choose that? Uh, I actually just trial and error, aired them until my model gave me a decent result. <laughs> so uh, that was how I chose them. I, uh, I picked some, some values and then I got some decent results and, uh, and, and also performance. So uh, making sure that I could actually uh, rank. <laughs> That's really funny, David. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so it was just trial and error and, uh, it's, I got a small data set and a small problem. And so like, if I, I go here and run, oh, come on. Oh, sorry. If I go here and build the model again, right. Oh, that's Redis. Go here and build the model again. Uh, and, and just let it go. This runs pretty quickly. And so I was able to iterate it, right? So here it goes, accuracy rising. I'm very happy. Look at that accuracy up in the nineties. Oh crap, it's in the forties. Uh, but so I'm able to run this quickly. So I was able to iterate and, and poke around with it. So I just did trial and error. So uh, Barry, you wanted to know where I got the data set? Um, actually, um, uh, a friend of mine had put it together uh, from scraping um, several websites that had their um, had scripts from the Scooby-Doo movie and cartoons on it. And so uh, he screen scraped all the data and made a little CSV file. And so I took that and used that to make this talk. Um, so, yeah, he had you gathered that data already. Good to have tech savvy friends. Yeah. So um, I, I, I slightly cheated. Um, I, I it was when I worked at Data Robot with him. And uh, I, I had left Data Robot, but he was going to give a talk at another conference. And so I suggested this as a talk topic. I suggested do mystery, mystery machine learning. And so he did a simple example and then created the data and then never did anything with it. And so, but I'd had the idea for mystery machine learning for a couple of years. And so I went ahead and turned it into a bigger talk and, and everything. So it, I, did I steal his idea or did I give him my idea and then go ahead and use it again? I'm not, not sure, but, but I used the data he gathered. It was very helpful. And I, I know he knows I'm doing this talk, so <laughs> I don't think he cares. <laughs> uh, let's see, any other questions? So are there any sample um, selling point of Redis.ai as a, as a typical use case? This is what is used in the world today. Um, I, I, the big selling point on Redis AI versus another model server um, is, um, I think it's twofold. I, I think um, one, uh, everyone can, there's a client for uh, Redis for, in almost any language you can conceive of, right? And so if you if you are using, you know, some obscure language like C sharp or uh, some really popular language like Elixir, 
um, then you could um, you could still talk to Redis, and so you could still make predictions. Uh, if you're using something like, I mean, obviously C Sharp can talk to machine learning things, but if you were uh, talking to using something like Elixir, which doesn't really isn't known for its data science libraries, um, you would have to you know take your model and wrap it up a, as a little uh, Python application and Dockerize it and make it a little restful server and everything. Whereas here you could just deploy it to Redis. And so it makes it more accessible to developers because you're probably, is, there's a good chance you're using Redis already anyhow, uh, because as a cache at, at the very least. Uh, and, and then the fact that we do support Onyx means the data science team can actually pick whether they want to use TensorFlow or PyTorch or uh, just use scikit-learn models or whatever. They can pick whatever tech stack they want and still deploy something to Redis as well. And so it sort of creates a, uh, a nice layer of abstraction between the developers and the and the uh, the data teams, and so I think that's a big advantage architecturally. It creates that nice separation of concerns. Um, uh, but the other advantage that uh, uh, Redis uh, AI has is that um, lots of times some of the data you need to make your predictions is already in Redis. Like normally, if you want to make a prediction with a model server, you go out and you say, uh, "Well, go here and read this data about uh, here, and then go read this other data here that's we already know." They provide some data, we read some of the data that we know, then we build a tensor and send it to them. And so we got to go out and read that data from that other database and turn it into a vector and maybe there's disk and network involved. And it, with Redis, um, that reference data could already be in Redis, in which case we are just going from memory to memory. And so you get a performance improvement. And we, we call that data locality, uh, where the data is local to where the execution is going to, the prediction is going to happen. So those are the two uh, big advantages, uh, I think, of Redis AI uh, as opposed to other ways of hosting uh, machine learning models. So, th thank you for the easy, easy question. I had that one prepared. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? If not, I can stop sharing my screen and we can commence with the, uh, the tomfoolery, right? Cool. We, we prefer prefer shenanigans here to tomfoolery. Just so yeah. You know. Sorry, I'm a Midwesterner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this was such an awesome talk. Thank you for joining us at this group and sharing the beauty of uh, machine learning and Scooby Doo. That was so much fun. Absolutely happy to do it. <laughs>